Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Independent Living Management presents Pioneers in Disability Rights and Community Organizing, an interview with Terry Susan Hartman. Hi, I'm June Kales, and I'm here with Doug Uziak, and we are interviewing Terry Susan Hartman. And Terry, what type of community organizing have you been involved with over the, your history? Well, most of the organizing I've done has been in the area of media and media advocacy, working with grassroots disability organizations, helping them to frame the debate, crystallize the message, and then amplify that through mainstream media. Can you talk okay. about the nature of what you've done with the, these community organizing groups over the years? Mm -hmm. um, back in 1979, I was... Um, actually working with abused kids and I got kicked in the face by a kid who was abused himself and it sprained the cervical part of my spine and I wore a neck brace and I felt went out on an audition and was discriminated against and it made me very angry and I can tap into that anger and that injustice and that discrimination in a moment so while today I don't have a disability what I feel is really important is that I had that experience in working, in feeling what it's like to have a disability. And I take that with me with a media expertise and working with grassroots organizations like ADAPT or TASH or NICL or the National Association of the Deaf, um, different disability organizations that are working on creating a message and wanting to bring that message to the general public vis-a-vis -vis the media. Terry, I, I take it since you mentioned you, you were discriminated against when you were applying for or going a, a, on an audition. I'm assuming then since you opened up our discussion saying that you're involved in marketing and other media aspects, did you take your past and bring it into the present? Absolutely. How did you go about doing that? Well, that was my true north. You know, you can have an intellectual experience in knowing that people are discriminated against. But unless you know it and you've had it, it uh, you don't really touch it and feel it. So that moment has become my true north. And it's made me a better AB. It's made me a better non-disabled advocate in the disability rights movement. The anger that I felt, I turned into action. And I stormed over to the Screen Actors Guild and I s demanded a meeting with the president. I said, you have committees for women and seniors and children and minorities who also face discrimination. This is temporary, but it's real, and what are you going to do about it? And we ended up setting a up a committee of performers with disabilities in the Screen Actors Guild. This was 79. Now, there weren't a lot of people with disabilities acting because there wasn't anybody on TV, and there was a lot of discrimination in terms of VR counselors saying, oh, you don't want to do that. It's not employment. You should make lawn chairs or screen doors or whatever they happen to be doing. And we really felt it was important to change attitudes because the media creates a very powerful sense of reality for people. And so because of negative images and stereotypes and the invisibility of people with disabilities, and when they were on television or film or in print, there was a focus on the medical model we really felt that it was crucial that we organize the entertainment industry to have increased employment opportunities and positive and accurate portrayals. And we set up a whole series of systematic change. Media advocacy was involved with that, for example. Um, this was the setup of the Media Access Office of the California Governor's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, who had started giving out annual awards, which is nice, but what happens the other 364 days of the year when people have cripple in their script or they hire non-disabled people to play people with disabilities? It's like putting someone in blackface. So what we did is we systematically looked at where the discrimination was and set strategies to eliminate it. When discrimination occurred blatantly, as in the remake of Johnny Belinda in 1982, where they just hired a hearing actress, we stormed into the network myself and the president of the Screen Actors Guild and the head of the National Association of the De National Center on Deafness at Cal State Northridge and the in-house legal counsel of the guild and we had a meeting. That room was so packed and so tight and they said, well, we can't slow down production. And we had two sign language interpreters 
who were reversing and expressing well, all the conversation. And they saw that meeting was not slowed down at all. And they said, we screwed up, we're sorry. And there was, that was a break in the tension in the room. And we thought, well, that's fine. But then we went to Daily Variety and we asked them to print what they promised to do because we knew damn well that the next day they would forget and it'd be business as usual. So we had to show our muscle and show our strength. And we did those kinds of protests a couple of times so that the Hollywood creative industry understood that this is a civil rights issue, it's not a charity issue. And now there are over 600 actors with disabilities, mostly in Hollywood, but also in various parts of the country. And we see them on recurring themes. There's leaders like Victoria Ann Lewis, who worked at the Mark Taper Forum in setting up the Other Voices Project, um, in working in theater. Um, there's just countless, countless examples in advertising and television, both daytime and primetime and comedy. And it's quite extraordinary. You can see real concrete changes on, on in the media in terms of what you've done. Bring us up to date in terms of what happened with your work from the early 80s to, to now. Well, um, Mary Johnson and I, who was the editor of the Disability Rag, who is now the editor of the Ragged Edge, and I got a NIDER grant to write a book called Making News. And this book, we wanted to disseminate amongst all the SILs to adapt, to TASH, to all the different grassroots organizations. We started out presenting at conferences and getting information. So it was a presentation on media skills. And it was also information gathering on what disability rights leaders needed to do to build relationships with the press and to make a difference. So it's actually a primer, a glossary, and it goes into different strategies. And that was very effective. And now um, I think you're interviewing Bill Strothers and Cindy Jones, and they'll be talking about accessible society and media talk, a listserv. Now that we're now in the internet age, there is a wonderful listserv uh, for disability advocates that are interested in media. And this was, a, was the platform, because we wanted people to have the same information. We wanted people to know how to frame the debate. How do you take? What you know is a shifting paradigm in disability from the medical model to the rehab model to the charity model to the independent living and the empowerment model. And what kinds of sound bites do you use? You know, free our people. We will ride. You know, same struggle, different difference. Not dead yet. I mean, those are sound bites because we work in a media that needs sound bites to wrap the whole debate around disability. And by taking and powering those sound bites and putting our spin on it, we are in the process of educating the media. Now it doesn't always work. Because we know you can pick up any newspaper or you know, you could if you could call up dial news and you could hear any newspaper, the program that NFB has. Um, and you can look at any television broadcast and you're gonna hear um, crippled, wheelchair bound, confined to a wheelchair, etc. So another project we did was working with the AP Style Book, which is called the Bible for Reporters. And we worked with them in 93, and we just worked with them again last year. And what it is, is it divides, uh, it's a, it shows reporters how to write, how to spell certain words, what to say, what not to say. And when we first started out, everything was in the word handicapped. So the first level, of, of awareness for them and training for them was that, no, 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 this is not right. So I don't know if you can zoom in on that or not. And if not, I can leave it with you and you can zoom in later. But here it says disabled, handicapped, impaired. And it says what to do and what not to do. Thou shalt do and not do. And for, since 1993, the following phrase has been on page 75. It says, wheelchair user. People use wheelchairs for independent mobility. Do not use confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound. If a wheelchair is needed, say why. Now, we all know that since 1993, there's been a hell of a lot of use of confined to a wheelchair and wheelchair bound. But one really wonderful strategy that's been activated by Marianne Jones, who's the executive director of the Westside Center for Independent Living is, 
she Xeroxes this page. Every time she sees it used, she will Xerox this page and say, thank you for the article outlining disability issues. However, according to your own AP style book, please refrain from using wheelchair bound confined to a wheelchair. And slowly, very slowly, because reporters, it's like a revolving door at media outlets. It's a constant re-education. It's the same kind of re-education when you think about the Congress in 1989 and 1990 that voted for ADA is a very different, and there's majority of new people that, that Nickel and other groups have to keep re-educating. Same principles when you're doing media advocacy. You want to draw on strategies that they, that your uh, target audience, the media, can understand. They understand investigative journalism. They understand advertising. They understand public relations. They understand grassroots organizing and lobbying. So you want to combine all those components in any media campaign that you have because your end goal is educating the general public. The way you do it is through the media, and we have to educate them at the same time. I mean, they have absorbed the same kind of negative stereotypes and myths and biases that everybody has. They're not immune to it just because it's their business. So we're dealing with them on a professional level and also on a personal level, and you have to address both. Terry, you, you mentioned about showing the muscle. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be interested to hear some of the stories of where you showed the muscle, because unlike other movements where there's uh, a, an automatic economic realization or impact to, to what you're doing, or there's uh, uh, racial minorities where th there's an identifiable group that can organize and that can be seen, I'd be curious to know how you, as in your role as a media consultant, has be, have been involved in showing that muscle. Well, several ways. It really depends on the situation. Any kind of good organizing, you need to know who your opponent is. You need to do your research and understand them so that you can communicate with them and kind of go underneath their defenses and over their attitudes. So oftentimes, if the audience is you know, corporations or reporters. Um, I like to start with humor because it, def it, it diffuses a situation. And you know that people are uncomfortable with people with disabilities. There's that fear. It's the only minority you can really join um, that you, that there's a state. Well, you can join other ones too, I guess. Um, but uh, if you want to change your gender and things like that. But if generally, um, I think people are afraid and fearful. And there's lots of issues that are bubbling underneath the surface. So I often say when I'm talking to groups that, you know, people with disabilities are the largest minority aside from men. And uh, go into what the numbers are. And talk about how this rainbow coalition of diversity groups, there's an infrared and an ultraviolet. And even though you can't see it, we know and everybody knows it's there. So that already you take their context and you're grafting onto their belief system, our belief system, which is that the disability rights movement is part of the civil rights movement. That's on the first level. So they can start thinking about that. And then depending upon the situation, we use, we draw from experiences from other uh, movements. For example, to say, uh, well, here's an example. Bree Walker and Jim Lampley uh, we're TV news anchors in Los Angeles. Bree has a disability called ectrodactyly, which is a fusing of the bones in the hands and the feet. She um, was pregnant, and a radio talk show in Los Angeles questioned her right to have a baby. You know, was it fair for her to bring a child into the world knowing that baby strikes against it? And it went on for an hour. It was a referendum for eugenics. Now, if you had said, Oprah Winfrey's pregnant. Is it fair for her to bring a child into the world knowing there'd be discrimination against that African-American baby? Or is it fair for Connie Chung to bring a baby in? There would have been such an outrage, and first it probably wouldn't have been done at all. So what we needed to do was to systematically deconstruct that one hour show to illuminate eugenics, reproductive rights of people with disabilities, parenting rights, and the whole host of issues that were underneath the surface that were manifest by the ignorance in that one um, 
radio show. So what we did is we knew we needed a legal component. So Paul Stephen Miller, who's now an EEOC commissioner, at the time he was director of litigation for the Western Law Center on Disability Rights. We went through the FCC regulations. Now there was no fairness doctrine, it had been gutted, but what he found was personal attack clause, which says basically that if a group of, uh, if one person of a group is attacked on the air, then you are thereby attacking that whole group and you have to let them know in advance. You have to provide them an opportunity for rebuttal. They didn't do that. So with well, one clause, we filed an FCC complaint. Now we knew that what we wanted to do was to illuminate the disability rights movement. So we made copies of that tape. We sent it out to over 100 disability organizations and individuals and advocates. We asked them to sign on to the complaint. So that's one legal strategy. Okay, we'll put that there. Then there was a media strategy and a public awareness strategy. And we wanted to illuminate the deep discrimination that people with disabilities face. We wanted to expose the fact that there were some HMOs and medical providers that were saying that as a result of prenatal testing, if you knew your child would be born with a disability, they would consider that a pre-existing condition and you're on your own. We wanted to illuminate the fact that there is a premise that people with disabilities are not sexual and incapable of being parents because after all we have to take care of them. So there was a whole host of areas. We brought in a lot of different people to work on this formulating the messaging. Carol Gill, who's a psychologist, Barbara Waxman, may she rest in peace, who was a real political organizer on sexuality and issues, and Adrian Ash, who is an, um, an ethicist who's blind, who's part of the Society for Disability Studies. And what we did basically, which can be replicated, is we framed the debate. We said, this is outrageous, and this cannot happen. Now we took it one step further because once you have your message crafted, then you have to present it to the media, which you know is really a crapshoot because it depends on their attitudes. So guilty for being manipulative on the media, we chose reporters who we trusted, who we knew would get it because we knew it would take on a life of its own. So we picked Joe Shapiro, who was at US News and World Report, who's now at National Public Radio. We picked Jay Matthews at the Washington Post. We picked Mike Fleeman at the Associated Press, Steve Holmes at the New York Times who had covered ADAPT in the past, and um, those are the ones that we picked. And we got articles, like huge articles like in the Washington Post. They framed the debate. Um, and these, these were just astonishing. Um, and, and disability rights advocates were quoted in them. And we had ground rules which is quite bold and ballsy for us to have done it, but we needed to say, you cannot interview Bree and Jim unless you interview these professionals with disabilities. And the media abided by it. We never thought to ask or demand for that. You know, you make demands in political organizing all the time. But this was a new awareness for all of us, and we agreed that unless there was banked with advocates and professionals with disabilities in those interviews, it ran the risk of being a celebrity fluff piece. The other thing we did is when we were ready to have a press conference, we wanted the media to come to us. And we had the press conference at the Westside Center for Independent Living, where June used to be the executive director where we first met, actually, a very long time ago. And that room was packed. We had the executive director of the SIL introducing everybody. We had Barbara Waxman talking about sexuality. We had Carol Gill talking about psychological and, and different um, um, uh, overview of psychological and so psychosocial kinds of issues. We had Bree and Jim talking last. We had Lily Beth Navarro, who was a member of ADAPT. We had national spokespeople like um, uh, Nancy Becker Kennedy, who was also a member of ADAPT, but was a producer at KCT at the time. And we deliberately had uh, Brie and Jim talking last. And they echoed what we had echoed. And it was a stunning press conference. And this story got picked up around the world. And Barbara Walters did a piece on 2020 and talked to Brie and talked to her mom, who also has the same disability, and talked about inheriting a disability. 
And so then there was a strand about pa the power of parents with disabilities, parenting kids with disabilities. And that was really quite um, an accomplishment because it reframed the debate on reproductive rights and parenting rights. And there's been more contemporary examples. For uh, example, last year when Nike did the dry goat ad uh, in Backpacker Magazine that said, basically, buy our shoes or you'll compress your spine and you'll end up drooling in a wheelchair at the state fair with a license plate with your name on it, which is so outrageous. And Marcy Roth, who was the director of advocacy at Nickel at the time, who is a supreme organizer on the internet, blasted emailed everybody, and within 48 hours, they got thousands and thousands of letters, and it kept building and building and building. They pulled the ad. And they pulled the ad without a level of sophistication because they apologized and said, well, in essence, some of our employees are wheelchair bound. You know, you could see they, like, didn't get it. They just wanted the fire to go away, but they weren't realizing they were putting, like, gasoline on the fire. Um, and we didn't let up. And those are the kinds of victories that are just very exciting because in the process we're training the media. Um, another example is um, what we did with the president. Let me interrupt you for a minute. That was a, a very compressed victory. It was. Where the muscle was actually exercised very quickly using online organizing. Yes. But were there any other components to that piece of that you want to add about the online organizing? Well, Paul Longmore, who is a uh, professor of history at the San Francisco State University and an organizer, and studied media, he's really um, analyzed media images for many years. And he says that the internet is the single most powerful organizing tool for our community. And I agree. With everybody who's in the movement having such demands, and we're fighting on so many fronts, if you can just flick a switch and dial and send it, where we used to have to write letters and type it and send it and mail it and uh, all that kind of stuff, it's immediate. And anger is great. If you can harness that anger and that sense of injustice immediately and move it into action, then you're flexing your power and you're communicating to your opponent the power you have. But, you know, life being what it is, anger dissipates and you're pulled in four other directions. So if you don't do it immediately, sometimes it doesn't get done even though we want to do it. So the rage that that cultivated so quickly, plus the online message made for a real express yes. response. Do you have any other examples like that that involve yeah. some online? There was. Uh, this was last month. It was one of the cases where somebody with a developmental, I believe, it was one of the cases where someone with a developmental disability was on trial. And the AP headline said something about retarded something. And, of course, the ARC jumped on that. And then it was sent to Media Talk, which is what Bill, Bill and Cindy will talk about the online organizing, I hope, in their interview. And, um, and so people were contacting the AP. They were contacting Yahoo because that was, had the AP article on it. And we're talking about images and language and everything. And we called the folks, the editor of the AP style book, who said, oh, no, we never say retarded when we were talking about language changes. So, and they, internally shot an email and changed it. I mean, it was, it was within four hours. Now, um, Beth Holler, who's a journalism professor at Townsend University, and Marcy Roth, um, who's now at the National Spinal Cord Injury Association Executive Director, they captured that. I mean, they downloaded it. So they have the example of what happened, and then four hours later, as a result of immediate organizing, how it was changed. So there, there are other examples um, of that, but I think those are two stunning examples. And, you know, the truth is we've all been led to believe we're powerless, and we're not. Harry, what, what would be the step-by-step -step approach to organizing the various issues around the media or working with the media for individuals that are doing this locally? It depends on the issue. 
It depends on the agenda of the organization. And you have a couple of goals, long-term goals and short-term goals. Long-term goals, it's important for our community to set up ourselves as spokespersons and to set up our organizations as sources for the press. You know, when there's a story, they'll go to a doctor, or they'll go to a nurse, they'll go to a lawyer. Well, we need to develop that same kind of savvy. And one way uh, to do that is to build relationships with the press. Um, you can do that proactively, and you can do that reactively, as Mary, jo Mary Ann Jones does at, Nickel at um, WCAL. Um, when articles come out or stories come out, you can pick up the phone, call them, send them an email, and saying, you know what, that's a great start, however, and then use that to educate them. That's the second goal. The third goal is to say, you know, when you do any kind of story about housing, there's a component on, you know, MACASA, that'd be a good opportunity to talk about MACASA, or Section 8, or whatever it happens to be. Um, if they're doing a story on uh, legal issues, let them know if there's like a Western Law Center or uh, the, the systems advocacy that independent living centers do. Um, use those opportunities to frame the debate, build relationships with the press so that when a situation comes up, you can call them and say, you know, you've covered this in the past. Conceptually, it's the same issue. It may look different. You know, Dan Wilkins has a phrase, same struggle, different difference, which I love because it just is so true. And use that as a bridge for communication. And that is um, one way. Another way is that since independent living centers and national disability organizations are te technically nonprofits, that in every community there is uh, an association that's comparable to, like the Southern California Broadcasters Association, because I live in Los Angeles. There's one in Northern California and all over different cities. It's a cluster of media outlets, television and radio. Now they're required to do public affairs or community affairs shows. That's a really good way for disability organizers to kind of cut their teeth and become more comfortable on camera and be able to say um, to the folks that are doing the interviews to correct language, to look at camera angles, to say, please don't talk to my interpreter, talk to me. There's a lot of education that can be done in those because it's informal, because it's done in advance. They can stop and roll tape. And you can start to develop some media savvy skills. Another strategy that doesn't cost anything is op-eds in every daily newspaper. Op-ed basically means opposite the editorial page, which the newspaper reserves for their point of view. So opposite that, or op-ed, allows you an opportunity to react to something that's in the paper. And they're usually 500 to 1,000 words. And what it does is it allows our movement to reframe the debate, if it's off, going off in a direction that's not a civil rights perspective, and introduce yourselves as a spokesperson, because you sign the letter with the organization at the very bottom, and set up the organization as a source. So spend a couple sentences saying, you know, here at WCIL, we do systems advocacy and la da da da, you know, tenant services, whatever. And those are some cost effective ways that don't take a big budget, because we have to be realistic about this as well. Now, the now other opportunity is called public service announcements or PSAs and local radio stations are required to air them and the format for every radio station is different but they're 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 60 seconds depending on the station and those are really good if you're having events or if you're having issues and you don't have to film them yourselves whether it's videotape or audio tape many stations just take the copy but we have to do our homework and make sure it's you know within the 10 seconds or 30 seconds, whatever they want. And what they do that way is they play them in rotation. Now, yes, they're played at 3 in the morning. Yes, they're played at 5 in the morning. It's not great times, but at least it's all part of getting the message out so that an organization can start to f refine its media savvy skills. Another strategy would be to build local alliances and coalitions with different diversity groups. 
um, when I chaired the communications subcommittee of the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, we found out that there was going to be a unity conference, which is a, a conference every four years for journalists of color. And what we wanted to do was to change their belief system and really educate them to let them know that we are part of the diversity radar screen and our civil rights issues are your civil rights issues. You had to sit in the back of the bus, we couldn't get on the bus at all. So that we drew parallels for them. Because if they're covering issues in their community and they come to a spokesperson in our community, we're building a much stronger coalition. Um, this was, we did this called the Disability Messenger. We talked about hate crimes. It's set up um, actually as a daily newspaper, except there's no sports section, which uh, John Lancaster was not happy about. He was the executive director of the President's Committee, because we didn't want to play into the super jock stereotype. So, but there's business, there's entertainment, there's metro, there's opinion and lifestyle. And so that's a tool that is available um, to organizations so that they could start to show reporters our issues are not just to be medicalized, that we belong in every part of a daily newspaper, business section, whatever it happens to be. Some advocates have complained that when they're involved in interviews with the press, they get asked questions that kind of throw them off, mm -hmm. that kind of take them in a tangent from the message they really want to deliver within those five minutes or three minutes. What's your advice about that? Well, you have to take charge. And you have to know that you are the expert. And you have to know that the person who's asking you the questions probably doesn't know squat about the disability experience. Have you seen that about us? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> She's no. right. <laughs> Present company excluded. Of course. Now, if somebody doesn't have a disability civil rights perspective, like a, I don't know, Christopher Reeve or something, and in the mindset of the reporters, they want to talk about cure because they're scared that that could happen to anybody. Um, but now he's starting to talk about more advocacy, which is great. But you know your message, and you have to be ferocious and relentless. It's like going to, you, to Congress or doing a rally and where the legislators or policymakers will say, no, it's, it's better for you to be in a nursing home. You're not going to say, oh, okay, let's talk about the benefits of nursing homes. You're going to be relentless and stay on mark and say, no, I know you probably want to know that, but we're here to talk about so-and-so and weave them back. You have to take control. Now, they're not going to let you, but, you know, power isn't given. You have to take it. You know, that famous quote that I wish I could remember by Frederick Douglass. Um, and you have to take charge. Here's some other examples of some of those really neat little statements you can make that kind of steer them back to where you want to be in the message you want to deliver. Well, if somebody, for example, is... Um, is deaf and the person who's doing the interview on camera is talking to the interpreter and the interpreter if they're doing their job is just going to be interpreting the questions they're not going to be responding the deaf person needs to say excuse me you know you have to direct the questions to me and talk to me and look at me so that I can answer them my interpreter is only here to facilitate communication. And can you take the camera off the interpreter, because they're really invisible, and put it onto us, because we are having this conversation. If um, somebody's using a wheelchair and you see the cameraman, um, this is a really good example, at ADAPT Actions, when we were doing press with ADAPT, there were reporters that were standing up and often interviewing people using wheelchairs. Well, the camera sits on a, tr a tripod, and what we asked them to do was to not tilt the camera downward when they talk to somebody with a disability using a wheelchair, because then if you're sitting in your living room watching the news, you're going to be looking down on Mike Alberg or Bob Kafka, Stephanie Thomas. We asked them to lower the tripod so that they were at eye level with the person with a disability because that's a, a, a powering, empowering camera angle. We ask them not to zoom on somebody reading their notes in Braille, to not zoom in on guide dogs, 
And when the conversation, uh, it, there's a gentle way to keep people on mark, and you'd be polite. Or when, another good example is when reporters say, you know, being handicapped or, you know, all the words that are just really awful. You know, say, let me just stop and correct you, and please use this word instead. Or you could say, please stop tape for a second. Uh, the cameraman may not know what to do, but they'll stop. And you have a conversation right there on the spot. Because there's no reason for us not to educate them. Because then you got, you're off mark, you're not giving your message, and you're starting to feel this sense of I'm not important and that this is bullshit. But remember, the end goal is using them in a good sense. Can you reflect on some other adapt actions where um, the organizers, the leaders, the advocates, examples of where they handled the media very well? Well, it's great. When, when it was apparent that ADA would include transportation, um, and it was signed in July of 1990 by President Bush, the, the next ADAPT action was going to be in the fall. They do a fall action and a spring action. And usually it's following the association. So it was transportation, it was APTA. If it was nursing homes, it'd be ACA, American Healthcare Association. So the next ACA um, convention was going to be in October in Atlanta. And the organizers, Mike and Wade was al Wade Blank was alive at the time, Bob Kafka, Stephanie Thomas, Mark Johnson, um, talked about Atlanta symbolically as a place where Martin Luther King left the pulpit to start the civil rights movement and organizing. So right there, we have uh, framed the debate for the press. Secondly, um, Morehouse College is there, which is a traditionally black college, historically black college, I think is what they're termed as. And Lewis Sullivan, who was then Secretary of Health and Human Services, had spoken there like the week before, two weeks before, knew the dean. And so the goal was to have the dean talk to Lewis Sullivan because he was not listening to people with disabilities. Now what's interesting is that ADAPT had requested a meeting with Lewis Sullivan on uh, numerous occasions and were blown off. So we're down in Atlanta. We're thinking about multiple days of actions. And I was not involved in the picking <coughs> of the targets because my, uh, my, or my sense is that it needs to be generated from you know, the grassroots political point of view and whatever you guys decide will spin a media tail around that or hook for it. So we had you know, contacted all the media. Um, the first target was uh, Morehouse College, which was shut down. And while the students were first inconvenienced, they realized, hey, discrimination and prejudice anywhere is discrimination and prejudice everywhere. And so the students were organizing with the ADAPT activists. And the next morning, the um, president of the college did make a statement, okay, day one. Day two was going to the federal building. Now, they had requested meetings with Lewis Sullivan, and in the media calls, you know, we did local press and national press. I happened to call National Public Radio. I happened to. I really wanted them to cover it. And Daniel Shore has a quote that says, if you don't exist in the media, then practically speaking, you don't exist at all. So I called Daniel Shore, and I said, look, you know, they're telling us that Lewis Sullivan is out of the country. We're down here in Atlanta at the regional office. He said, wait a second, he's not out of the country. As a matter of fact, tomorrow he's going to be here doing an interview. Why don't you guys call in and I'll put you on the phone with him since you can't get him on the phone, which was great. So we went down the wrong way on one way Martin Luther King Drive. You know, a couple hundred ADAPT activists circled and shut down the federal building. From an accessible sandwich shop across the street, Bob Kafka got on the phone dialed into the NPR studio, got it queued in, and talked to Lewis Sullivan. And said, how come, you know, Secretary Sullivan, your office is telling us you're out of the country, you're not, you're here in Washington, you're saying you don't want to meet with us, okay, we're following that, now we're here at the, at, you know, the regional office and they've locked us out, could you please call them and tell them that, that we're doing exactly what you wanted us to do? And it was great, and it pissed them off, and that's great, because then we're, we, got the, we put the debate out there, and we're reframing it. 
there were countless of examples of that in working with ADAPT for all those years. That's still the street theater. The, um, you know, if you're looking at inaccessible restaurants, you bring a table, you bring a chair, you sit on the sidewalk and they get pissed off. You say, well, hey, you got to fix it. You know? Terry, yes. For the local organizers, mm -hmm. how do you get to the reporters? I, I, tw over 20 years ago, it used to be easy. The competition was greater. Um, it was easier to meet the various reporters. How do you do it now? How, how does a local organization actually get to know the people and the decision makers? Well, it, it speaks to the point of building relationships, Doug, which is very, it's the core of what we do. You have to do your homework. You can look at articles they've written. You can call them and just say, thank you for doing that article you know, on this area of discrimination against the African American community, whether it's education, housing, medical issues, transportation, whatever it happens to be. And you introduce yourself. You say, we're happy to be a source. Whenever you're covering this issue, you know, think about the applications on disability. If you have time, we'd like to come in and meet with you and your staff. Um, we'll send you information. We're happy to provide comments. And it's a very slow and tedious process. You need to know what um, media outlets are in your community. When you're planning events, it's important to contact the Associated Press or Reuters or Knight Ritter, which are wire services or the local newspaper to find out which one has a day book because that is a summary of all of the events that are happening the next day. So if you're doing a protest, you're doing a press conference, then it's, that saves time and energy because they've put it in their master list and then you follow up with each of the individual outlets. But you have to be relentless. And just as there's turnover in Congress, and there's turnover in policymakers. There's also the same kind of turnover with reporters. But the good news is they'll end up someplace else. So the time you invest in educating them will be well spent because they will go another place, and then they become your advocates on the inside. Sounds like a lot of homework. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of homework. homework. It really is. Terry, I want to go back to you started to talk about street theater yeah. and the inaccessible deli where they just set up their own tables and chairs and outside and brought the bologna and the mayonnaise yes. and the lettuce and yes. said disabled seating here, I think is what they yes. said. Can you give some other examples of effective street theater that you've seen over the years, maybe the walk of shame or things like that? Yeah, in, um, in Hollywood there's the walk of fame and there were no curb cuts. And so the ADAPT organizers just, and, and WCAL, they took sledgehammers and they created curb cuts, um, I believe. I, I remember seeing pictures of that. That was in the uh, 70s, 80s, a long time ago. Um, but it's very effective. Um, ADAPT does a lot of that. Give us some um, other examples. That are well, if you're real. trying to, um, if you're getting to different parts of the problem, for example, um, and you're going to a, a state health care association, and you want them to understand what it feels like to be locked in a nursing home. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. Some of the most effective posters, which I, my favorite was a poster with a picture of Lewis Sullivan that said, wanted for crimes against people with disabilities, incarceration, and it was very effective, but like an Old West wanted poster, and you really got it. Um, there was uh, one that Mary Johnson and I developed called was with Q&A. Like, what's the difference between jail and a nursing home? You know, the uniforms, you know, they, they drug you, they don't have guns, they have drugs. I mean, all of those kinds of things. They rob you of your individuality and your choices, et cetera. Um, but the street theater, um, when ADAPT went to HICFA, the Healthcare Financing Administration in Baltimore, the Security Administration, it's this huge complex. And they literally surrounded the building so that all the entrances and exits were locked down. And to look at the faces of these employees and the fear and the panic, you could see through the window that they got it, that they felt locked up. 
and they were uh, they were not in control. And you could watch the aha kind of effect, which was very powerful. And you saw people panicking, and those that could crawl out of windows did. And then when the point was made, people left. And there's one parking lot at the Social Security Administration. And they lined up, folks lined up in their wheelchairs in rows, and then slid out of their chairs onto the ground. Well, thousands of employees that work at that and leave at 3 o'clock go into the parking lot. They could not move their cards. So again, they were trapped. You're adapt, you're trapped, get used to it. And that they had to do, they brought in bulldozers, they moved a chain link fence, and they bulldozed a road so those thousands of employees could go home. Then they went down to the street, to the intersection of Security Boulevard in Baltimore, and just did this rotation inside the crosswalks and shut down traffic. So then we got SIG alerts, then we got major traffic jams, then we got people really getting the fact that, ooh, this is inconvenient, I don't like this. And that, that was, well, that was one, of the, one of the really good um, uh, actions. There was one that just came in my mind that was equally as powerful. Um, they all are for different reasons. When the uh, Americans, when it was fear that, well, it was the Wheels of Justice March in March of 1990. And it was a time with the Nickel Conference, and there were a th over a thousand people with disabilities in the street from the White House to the steps of the Capitol. Then there was a rally, and then some of the ADAPT activists crawled up the Capitol steps, which was controversial. Um, the next day, ADAPT scheduled a bogus tour of the rotunda. And they knew that they were going up there and that they were going to demand a meeting with the congressional leadership, Foley and Mitchell and Hoyer. And when they got in the rotunda, now there's one elevator up to the rotunda, so it's a very slow process, but when they all got up to the rotunda, they took chains and chained themselves together in the rotunda and started chanting and demanding to meet the congressional leadership who came there and talked to them. And they said, well, we can't pass ADA now. And they demanded no weakening amendments, et cetera, et cetera. When they left, they said, the police said, you don't want to leave. And they didn't leave. So there were riot gear. There were uh, police and state troopers in riot gear, full riot gear with, with the visors and everything, in single formation that surrounded the group and started cutting out the wires. And then there was a group downstairs that were cheering them on. And it was so profound that here we are in the seat of democracy and that people are being chained out and excluded from the justice that our country was built on. And did the media get the, the message and, the, and the, the theater and the juxtapositions yes. and, the, and the parallels? For the most part, they did. And that action in 1990 started to really raise the awareness of the Washington, D.C. press corps, which is very hard boiled. And they've been back since. And it's difficult to capture them. Absolutely it is. Um, another wonderful action was in the, in the um, state of Illinois building in Chicago. Uh, the American Medical Association is there. Louis Sullivan was heading up the commencement ceremonies. So ADAPT activists went in with different family members and you know, started chanting when he started speaking. We have footage of Bob Kafka being dragged out of there uh, while they're playing America the Beautiful in the background. Um, there was um, Paulette Patterson, who worked at the Independent Living Center at the time, um, went to the, the judge because the judge was not, they, they were frisking people with disabilities as they were coming into the state of Illinois building. And, obstructing their justice. And the judge said, you can't do that. You have to let people with disabilities in. So Paulette came from the judge and then followed by hundreds of people with disabilities into the state of Illinois building, and they shut it down. And the press said, you know, they may look disabled, but this is one of the best stage protests the city has seen in a long time. They shut down the elevators. They shut down the escalators. People are trapped. The state troopers don't, can't arrest them because the local security company didn't give them permission. The police don't want to get involved because it takes four people to move someone with a power chair. And, you know, and all these things are happening. So they really pointed out all of the different um, elements of it. And it was a very powerful action with a press conference afterwards. And it tied in 
the local, the state, and the national issue. Because the um, time, governor was um, Edgar Scissor's hands, who they called him for ripping the budget and denying people access. <laughs>